introduce Tom McGillivray. He's the Chief of Cardiac Surgery here at Methodist and certainly knows a lot about uh, congenital heart disease, both in infants and adults. And he's here to talk about supravalvar stenosis. I have uh, no disclosure, no disclosures, I guess, uh, but I'm working on them. So we're going to start with talking about uh, supravalvular aortic stenosis. It's a an uh, unusual lesion, but uh, that doesn't keep us from subdividing it into uh, several different types. Type one is uh, a uh, thick fibrous uh, band uh, just above the aortic valve or at the level of the sinotubular junction. Uh, type two is a, a membranous uh, lesion uh, just above the valve, and type three is a more diffuse narrowing. Uh, we commonly think about supravalvular aortic stenosis associated with uh, Williams syndrome, which is a uh, defect in elastin uh, synthesis. And there's a characteristic uh, facies, there's a, a psychosocial developmental uh, delay, uh, and uh, supravalvular uh, aortic stenosis uh, and uh, other things. But it, uh, you can have supravalvular stenosis outside of uh, syndromic uh, uh, Williams uh, syndrome. It occurs about uh, one in every 20,000 uh, live births, uh, non-syndromal or non-Williams syndrome uh, supervivular aortic stenosis is much less common. Uh, Gary will talk a little bit later about anesthesia, but, but uh, a very common concern that we have with these patients are that they are at high risk of sudden death uh, when they have procedures, particularly when they have uh, anesthesia, and in part, that's related not only to the supravalvular aortic stenosis, but also associated lesions, including uh, coronary osteal stenosis. Uh, about 80% of these patients will have peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. 40% uh, will have proximal pulmonary artery stenosis, which both <clears throat> together or even separately can cause significant right ventricular uh, hypertension. Uh, the uh, the uh, elastin synthase de deficiency results in a loss of a Wynn Kessel effect, that loss of the uh, diastolic uh, compliance of the aorta can uh, result in uh, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction as a consequence. There are a number of different operations uh, that uh, are popular to fix this. Uh, these, uh, the DOTI operation, which involves uh, patching open the stenotic lesion. I prefer the, uh, the operation where we actually use autologous tissue. You open up the sinuses and, uh, and uh, tripartite the uh, ascending aorta and interdigitate it into the sinuses to patch and enlarge it. Despite those uh, good operations, uh, unlike most stenotic left-sided lesions that over time progress, interesting thing about uh, supravalvular aortic stenosis, that many of these kids over time will have a decrement in their gradient and they will have an increase in the size of their uh, uh, supravalvular uh, area. Uh, and so that many of these kids can avoid uh, an operation over time depending upon what their uh, gradient is and what their, uh, uh, what their symptoms are. Uh, oh, the uh, dreaded uh, aortic arch embryology slide. This is usually when the eyes roll back and people start to have uh, uh, fall asleep. But this, uh, the, the, the take home message from this is that the development of our aortas when we're uh, embryos are very complicated. We start out with six branchial arches and end up in one. And that is a result of convolution or involution of most of those ar arches. And while that's happening, you can develop uh, a number of different arch anomalies. It's amazing it doesn't happen more often than it does. A very uncommon uh, lesion interrupted aortic arch, uh, certainly uncommon in adults, although we do see some type A uh, interrupted aortic arches in, in adults, but, uh, but much less common in adults. Uh, type B, so type A uh, is a um, interruption between the left subclavian artery and the descending aorta. The most common type is type B, and that's an interruption between the left common carotid and the left subclavian artery. Uh, they are uh, very commonly associated with a ventricular septal defect. Uh, 
usually a posterior malalignment, ventricular septal defect. They can uh, commonly, they can uh, have uh, an associated aberrant right subclavian artery. Again, as you go back to the aortic arch uh, embryology, and frequently are associated with a uh, chromosocial, chromosomal microdeletion of the chromosome 22 and uh, DeGeorge syndrome. Type C uh, is an uh, interruption between the anominate artery and the left common carotid artery. Very uncommon, even in big uh, series. Um, a, uh, as, we're, as everybody is getting imaged for some reason or another, we're, we're learning that uh, Carmarol's diverticulum, which we used to think was very uncommon, may in fact be more common than we know. Uh, about 20% of patients with uh, a Comerol's diverticulum will have uh, symptoms of uh, swallowing or uh, upper airway obstruction, uh, but 80% of them will not, and they will be discovered incidentally. We used to think it was not a big deal in patients who didn't have symptoms. Uh, when I was back in Boston, we uh, took care of a fair number of these patients, and when we looked at them, uh, their tissue uh, every single one uh, in, in this, this series of 19 patients, when we looked at the tissue in the periaortic tissue, uh, every single one of them had uh, medial degeneration, uh, which puts them at risk of having uh, uh, dissections. And it is not an uncommon way for these patients to uh, meet their end by having a dissection or a, uh, or a rupture. So that there is an evolving uh, recommendation that these should be fixed even in asymptomatic uh, patients. A more common left-sided lesion, uh, coarctation of the aorta, uh, present in about one in every uh, 2,500 uh, live births. It, uh, is, uh, it makes up for about four to 8% of congenital heart anomalies. There is some debate as to what causes it, uh, when I was uh, uh, in training, we thought it was migration of ductal tissue that caused uh, narrowing of the uh, isthmus, just like uh, the uh, ductus, arterios, ductus arteriosus is supposed to do. But that really doesn't explain all of the problems. Uh, another theory, which is probably more accurate, is uh, a preferential flow through the ductus arteriosus, and you have uh, uh, underdevelopment uh, of the uh, aortic arch. Uh, coarctations of the aorta are more common in uh, males than in females by about two to one. Uh, maybe greater than 50% of patients with a coarctation will have a bicuspid uh, aortic valve. Uh, interestingly, uh, the thought is that even if you have a bicuspid valve in a coarct, the, the ascending uh, aortopathy may be a little less common, although that's a debatable uh, thing. It's interesting, too, that in patients with a right aortic arch, coarctation is almost never seen, uh, interestingly enough. In the old days when uh, we did natural history studies, the natural history of coarctations is 80% uh, of patients with coarctations will, uh, uh, will die before the age of uh, 50. The characteristic finding of a cork is a shelf at the isthmus, just, just, just beyond the level of the left subclavian artery. Uh, there's a proximal hypertension. Uh, and distal hypoperfusion, uh, as seen by the gradient uh, in that arterial waveform down below. Uh, different uh, nomenclatures for coarctation of the aorta, the uh, infantile or so-called preductal type coarctation, you see that's more of a hypoplasia of the distal aortic arch and proximal isthmus. Uh, the adult or postductal type, more of a discrete shelf uh, at, the, uh, at the level of the uh, aortic uh, isthmus. Uh, these are some intraoperative pictures of uh, a coarct repair of a, uh, of, a, of a baby. So just to orient your heads up here, feet down here, this is the aortic arch. Uh, left uh, common carotid artery, uh, distal arch, and the uh, left subclavian artery. This is the coarct segment here the ductus arteriosus, just we, so we, we, at least I used to think of the ductus as being a relatively small artery. The ductus is a huge artery. In an infant, it's actually sometimes the biggest artery uh, in, the, uh, in the body. Uh, 
uh, and it can be uh, very impressive to see. This is, it's uh, in, uh, uh, when you're looking at uh, children with coarctation of the aorta, the anatomy is not like the anatomy books. It can be very distorted and it's very easy, uh, even for very experienced surgeons, to become disoriented and uh, have problems. The usually way that we fix these is to get uh, proximal and distal control, uh, open up the arch, uh, sort of defy, uh, divide where the uh, coarctation segment was. Uh, the ductus arteriosus is here. This is the distal aortic segment. And fillet open the underside of the arch so you can get a big anastomosis that is important not only for the flow, but hopefully to decrease the incidence of having a stenosis um, when you're done or uh, later on down the road. And then the uh, uh, descending aorta is mobilized and sewn to the underside of the aortic arch. Uh, for such a small narrowing in the aorta, it can cause big problems uh, now in the future and maybe even more in the future. Uh, but at surgery, there are some potential uh, problems you can have. Uh, it's a very busy part of the chest. There are a number of different nerves. There are current laryngeal nerve. There's the sympathetic trunk that can give you a Horner syndrome. Uh, there's the uh, uh, vagus nerve, uh, the phrenic nerve. Uh, anytime you operate on big blood vessels, there's a chance for bleeding. Um, when you operate high up in the order, you, uh, you can interfere with the blood supply to the spinal cord. It's pretty unusual uh, to cause paralysis uh, when you're operating on coarctation just because of the collaterals. Uh, but uh, it's always in the, in the back of uh, your mind. And over the long term, there is a risk of developing uh, aneurysms. So as the babies and small children get bigger, the collaterals uh, develop and they get bigger. Uh, this is an image of uh, an older child with a coarctation. And the amount of coarctation, the amount of collaterals are really extraordinary. It's a virtual rat's nest, which uh, can make the uh, mobilization and the direct end-to-end -end anastomoses uh, more difficult uh, and certainly more treacherous. So there are a number of different operations that we have to manage those in older kids and uh, uh, in young adults involving rotational flaps or prosthetic uh, patches. Uh, we do extra, on, extra anatomic uh, uh, bypasses, which I think were more common in the old days than uh, now. And uh, in this situation, uh, at least what I prefer to do is to, to do an anatomic uh, reconstruction with a, with a tube graft. Um, a big 60-year uh, uh, report from the Mayo Clinic looking at over 800 patients that have had their coarctation uh, repair. Uh, as we know um, that uh, the younger you, that, that patients with coarctations that aren't fixed have a shorter life expectancy. Uh, patients who have a coarctation fixed after the age of 20 uh, also have a, a shorter life expectancy. Um, if you have uh, your coarctation fixed before the age of five, the likelihood of needing to have a reintervention uh, is uh, significantly higher. Uh, a common reason that we operate or find out about these are hypertension in young people. Uh, even after the operation, uh, the incidence of hypertension is still pretty high. Uh, and it seems to be related to the earlier you, the younger you are when you have your, uh, whether operation or intervention, uh, the less likely you are to have hypertension. But even uh, in the best of circumstances, uh, hypertension is still pretty uh, common. Uh, the risk of stroke. Patients with coarctation, uh, this is a recent report uh, from the, the group at Boston Children. They looked at uh, about four and a half million uh, patients looking at strokes in those patients with coarctations compared to those who don't. Uh, patients who uh, have coarctation are, are a higher risk uh, statistically of having a stroke, uh, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, and that they uh, have uh, an increased incidence even in those patients who have strokes of unruptured uh, cerebral uh, uh, aneurysms. So very important. Uh, 
And this is even if you factor in or factor out hypertension. So even if your blood pressure is under good control, you still are at risk of the stroke. And so it is essential to have good uh, follow-up uh, and good uh, imaging. Uh, the interventions that these patients uh, need isn't just re-interventions on their, uh, on their co-arc segment, uh, uh, perhaps because of the large number of uh, bicuspid aortic valves. A uh, large number of these patients will end up needing to have their aortic valves operated on. Um, uh, maybe because of their hypertension, they're at increased risk of, of, uh, of coronary uh, artery disease. Uh, there has been a, a big advancement, certainly in the last decade, of the use of transcatheter therapies uh, for the treatment of coarctation. And uh, uh, as a surgeon, I'm sorry to say that, uh, that it's probably the first-line therapy for uh, patients, uh, it really is a very good, uh, very good therapy for uh, uh, for taking care of the uh, coarctation segment and decreasing the likelihood of uh, having hypertension and problems thereafter. But in a very nice uh, editorial that uh, that Sabrina um, uh, wrote uh, when she was in uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, I think if we've learned nothing about coarctation and congenital heart disease, it isn't over until it's over. We need to constantly and consistently keep an eye on things. Congenital heart disease is a work in progress. The more problems that we identify and solve, uh, perhaps there are more problems that are yet to come. And along, as long as we keep that in focus, we'll continue to have uh, patients thrive. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all this morning.